This is the Storeroom BJJ podcast. I'm Anton Monenko. I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black, black belt. This is Eduardo Diaz. He's a fourth degree Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. And we have our first guest, Michael Pegg, who's also um, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, so, Michael, just introduce yourself a little bit and um, we'll kind of go from there. Um, so, uh, like Anton said, my name is Michael. Uh, I'm head coach of um, BJJ, uh, Gaha BJJ Nambo. Um, master's qualified exercise physiologist. Um, that's about it, really. I've got a bunch of other things I could say, but I don't think they're particularly relevant. So. Right, awesome. <laughs> but yeah, like um, it's it's awesome to have you on because obviously um, to do with BJJ, um, like overcoming injuries and things like that's like a really important um kind of aspect to look into. And I, you know, I know because I compete and things like that. So for me, that's been something that I've really had to kind of work on. Um, like moving through jujitsu and, and like learning that type of stuff, it's such a like important thing to kind of organize and, and get right because as any type of contact sport, there's always injuries and stuff like that. And, you know, I think that it's always best to like get on top of injuries straight away and mm-hmm. that type of thing. What, what do you, what do you think, what do you recommend like with such a strong background in that type of field? Uh, look, I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, problem with, uh, people starting jiu-jitsu is they think that they're going to lose something if they have a couple of weeks off when they get a little niggle. Yeah. And that's like uh, sort of uh, address it now, have a couple of weeks off, have a bit of rest. Saves you like three months healing time frame down the track just because you keep re-injuring the same site and see it time and time again like that white belt fever as they, you know, I've got a, got a little problem with my elbow but I think that's just jiu-jitsu when I keep training and then, uh, you know, six months down the track, they have to stop because they can't move their arms and stuff. It's, yeah, I've, I've, I was very fortunate that I'd kind of started my my, uh, my studies around the same time as starting jiu-jitsu. So I was kind of learning all those principles as I was going through. And I quickly understood that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's two weeks now, you know, it's, you're not, it, and I think people compare themselves a little bit to others and go, whoa, these guys are getting better. And it's like, oh, it's, it's two weeks. Mm-hmm. So take the time, look after yourself, ice it and get over it. And then you're looking at, you're looking at, do you want to be here when you're 70? That, that's, that's my kind of thing. I was never a big competitor or anything like that. Yeah. And I had no aspirations to be the world's best. But I did want to be doing this till I die, basically. So you just look after yourself, and and your sport will look after you, basically. Um, but Michael, when you, um, it's always always been great to have you on, at the gym because apart from your knowledge with sports physiology, you are black belt and you train jiu-jitsu, and you being part of the academy, uh, uh, you look after myself at one mm. point. You look after Anton a little bit at one point. You look after our, uh, uh, with a lot of other guys, you know at the gym and we have a lot of uh, people that are like 30s or 35s or even Mm. over 30 40 50 and what kind of uh, recommendation you give to them in terms of like uh, should them stretch or should how many times a week we get asked these questions all the time how many Mm. times a week they should train Uh, should they stretch should they should they um, do something um, aside from jiu-jitsu to have their joints strong enough so they can actually do Mm. jiu-jitsu what is your uh, view on that, please? Oh, look, I, I say this a lot, and I think the answer is always it depends. kind of depends on the individual needs of the person, how often they're training and all that sort of stuff. But certainly when you start hitting sort of mid to late 30s, if, if you want to train uh, to, the, to the volume to which you're accustomed when you are training a little bit younger... It's really important to start sort of looking after yourself and whatever whatever that kind of looks like. So for some people it's uh, maybe regular massage, other people it's it's yoga, other people it's sort of taking on a strength and conditioning program, factoring in all these other things like when, you know, oh, I've got work commitments, I've got this, I've got this. So, so for example, starting my new gym, um, I'm training six days a week, so I'm, I'm at the gym six days a week. Uh, I've got other work commitments outside of the gym as well, so I'm doing that three days a week. So at the moment for me, my my key element is rest. So so that's really important for me. I, I can't really fit in regular strength and conditioning, but what I can compensate that with is 
making sure the foam roll just before every session. But the main thing is I rest enough. So so at, at this stage, my key is rest. So um, your body only makes positive adaptation at rest. And so you impose a stimulus on it while you're training. Um, when you rest, the body goes, well, what was that? Okay, so for me to handle this a little bit better, I've got to put more muscle mass here, build bone mass down there and all that sort of stuff. So at, at this stage in my life, I'm making sure that I rest a lot. Some other people might only be sort of going, well, I'm coming to train in three days a week, but that gives me two days a week to do a bit of uh, sort of strength and conditioning yeah. and stuff. Unless you're going for athletic performance, the necessity for, for, for strength and conditioning as if you're an athlete isn't, isn't absolutely necessary, but definitely making sure that um, you address, address muscle imbalances and things like that. So you go, oh, my hips, my, I'm getting knee pain, which means your hips are really tight. So you do a lot of mobility work for your hips or oh, my knees pain, knee pain, my glutes might be really weak. So strengthen the glutes and stuff. So the answer is really it depends for, for individual people. For someone like Anton, you, your requirements are quite high. Yeah. So you've got to maintain a high volume of training to sort of compensate your athletic performance a little yeah. bit, I'd say. Yeah, so like you're talking about, I think like everyone kind of struggles in the area of like most aspects of their life is just finding the right balance for themselves totally. and things like that. And like you said, it's completely dependent on everyone's situation and mm. what they need and what they have but what do you think are some like the more common injuries that like are associated with brazilian jiu-jitsu particularly oh uh, well that'd be necks knees and backs yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um heaps of disc bulges for like in the in the necks and so stuff, more like uh, chronic type injury I, I would say a lot of the time it's it's overuse stuff yeah. um based on it's the style of game that you play. So for myself, I got some really bad C6, C7 disc bulges yeah. um, to the point where uh, it was so painful and these were coming, it was getting them once every three months. Like I'd, I couldn't move my neck and I'd be lying in bed and I'd have to walk my feet to the edge of the bed and then grab myself by the hair and pull myself upright. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good now. And then that was just like, oh, this is going to stop. Got some x-rays done, my thoracic, spine was really tight so I had to do a lot of thoracic mobility work so that the load of rotation was sort of eased a little bit on my neck um, and then I could loosen the thoracic up a bit I could move a little bit better but also I had to just stop getting stacked and and relinquish positions and get to the next position you know because it's kind of like well yes I've got a sub but now I can't walk for three days. So who won? Who won that battle? You know, like yeah, yeah the, the whole thing of jiu-jitsu is to, I guess, win a battle essentially. But who won that? You know, like he's got a broken arm, but you can't walk. So what? Who? Who won? So. I think it's a very good advice there because uh, I've been training for more than thirty years, and you, you had many injuries. Um, nowadays, I've been doing yoga regularly for a year. It's been wonderful for my mm. body. Like it's helping me a lot. Uh, but I feel like the, 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 there are times where you actually have to change your game a little bit Definitely. to be able to let the area, the area of your, of your body to heal, you know what I mean? And you have a, a, a it will kind of drag you towards the, do other games as well, which mm. can be very good, right? Like, because you're actually going to explore, you'll be obligated to explore other parts of your game and build a stronger game. Absolutely, um, yeah. You're not going to be able to do bearing bowlers when you're 45 and you have a neck injury, you know what I <laughs> totally. mean? Like, uh, but I feel like there's another thing as well. There is, I think all, all the, all, everyone that actually is doing jiu-jitsu for a while knows is like, and you tell at, at the academy for a beginner, like jiu-jitsu is great because it works, right? Mm. The, the mechanics work and it will hurt the other person. So it's super important that the person, when they start training, they believe in what the coaches are saying and tap. Mm, because definitely. this is one of the easiest ways you're going to get injured. You're not going to tap, you're going to see what happens and you're going to get injured. Like, and that injury will prevent you from keep training. That's so it. everyone yeah. else is going to get better and you're not going to be able to because you're going to have to stop and address. And you kind of get, um, it's, uh, it's really it's interesting too because if you get injured, what stops, it, it's really crucial to maintain a habit. And, yeah. and sustain your habits and things like so if you get injured and you stop coming the hardest thing for most people to re-implement is the habit of turning up you know so it's it's like you get injured and you're like oh i'm feeling better but i 
now they have it, I don't turn up anymore sort of mm-hmm. thing. So it's like at my gym, my guys. I've got the gym, uh, the strength and conditioning stuff in the gym. So if they get injured, that's they go, oh, I have to put my membership on hold and all that. And well, no, treat that membership as a fortnightly fortnightly rehab session. This is one of the most amazing things when you told me like that uh, Michael is innovating because he has his knowledge uh, and he actually treats his uh, members when they get injury, if they get injury, like to be able to, they, they have uh, all the equipment on the side and he'll put them to do a series of exercise to rehab them so they can keep coming to the to, to the training, to the, like close to the mat area and do the exercise and that's inclusive in the membership, right? Yeah, yeah. It's super, so. super amazing. It's an amazing job, you know what I mean? Like a great use of your knowledge and to make people like feel good and keep keep getting the socialization and keep in contact, I think is amazing. And the, the, those two key elements that you just mentioned there at the end is really important is is the maintaining that sense of community and the formation of yeah. the, and the maintenance of the habit of turning up on time. So you go, well, I'll give you a rehab program. You can do it during class times. Um, but what that does is keeps them salivating. So they're watching the, they're watching people train then mo- it's, it's giving them the motivation to do the rehab because a lot of times like when you when you get a sedentary individual that I've, I've dealt with before yes you you put a rehab program in and they have no why like why am I doing this it, mm. I still feel like crap but if you engage them in something that's meaningful to them then they've got the why and they salivate for it and they go oh this is why I'm doing it I want to maintain the thing that I like to do mm-hmm. and that's more important than the strength and conditioning program itself is maintaining this habit and their why which is, is really critical um, so yeah I get get them to come in do their rehab program during class times they turn up they're watching it they're giving themselves meaning to, to maintain the program and then they get back on the mats and the transition the habit is maintained for turning up during class times so they're going to slip straight back into it and they're going to feel confident of, that, that they're going to be okay, basically. When you talk about like injury rehabilitation, like one of the, the main uh, uh, cases that I ever uh, follow up that was really close in my life that I see was what happened to Anton, like what happened to you. Yeah. Like where, if you can just tell a little bit about like, because I remember that the doctors gave him, like he had a, a very serious injury and the doctors gave him a, a, a long, like a, a nine months or a year. Yeah, yeah. I remember I went to the doctor with you one day and the, the, and she said she gave her a huge time like to recover and that was this main competition, uh, world stage competition that he has to go. And I have actually thought it wasn't possible, you know, and mm. When I, he, he can tell a little bit better in detail, but when I actually saw him competing like uh, at the competition, he ma- managed to get himself. And um, when he got to the competition, like, and I saw him fighting like uh, Ken, Kenan Duarte, which is a world champion, renew one of the best guys as well in a world stage. And he had an amazing fight. I could not believe it. I was watching the TV and I just like blew my mind completely. Like I never heard of a case of a guy has a senior, serious injury recovers it much earlier time than than what is expected and goes to the world stage fights like one of the most renewed guys uh and does a really good match it was like a 2-0 but anto had great chances like a 2-0 tells it the story you know what i mean like mm. it's an even fight so it was amazing so can you tell us how what happened then yeah so like um i think this might have been at the end of 2018 or something like that but yeah i had a massive massive knee injury competing in brazil um at one of the grand slams so um one of the major tournaments for brazilian jiu-jitsu and i had a heap of different damage in there so i thought it wasn't as bad initially pretty much broke everything though, yeah, yeah when you saw much. the report <laughs> tore the mcl acl pcl had some damage lcl's torn so I had like a huge massive knee injury um and like initially I thought like oh, it's bad but I didn't think it was so catastrophic and then once it had been checked and everything I was like man you're gonna have to have complete re- reconstruction and, and like um reattachment of this ligament and this ligament and all this stuff so it was pretty disappointing and upsetting but even I think the biggest thing for me like the reason I was able to get back and and it was only about four months um, after the surgery which is pretty quick because normally like the turnaround time for like full um, contact or going back to normal kind of like um, activity is about 12 months mm. so 9 to 12 months so 
I think the only difference was, man, like the moment I found out what the issue was is I already started rehabbing. So even before mm. the surgery, I was already starting to do some type of exercises just to maintain strength and, and um, some like uh, muscle mass and everything. So I was just, the moment, even from the injury, I already started just working mm. on it icing helping it all this type of thing and then um you had a really good motivator too like you wanted to get yeah, back yeah, on your mats too, i wanted so. to get back on the mats but i also knew like all right like this competition is you know four or five months away so look there's a potential that i can do it so if i just mm. work as hard as i can maybe i can go there maybe i can't like and i didn't like limit myself and say like i need to be i'm just gonna look i'm gonna work as hard as i can and if i can make that tournament and i feel fine in training inspiring and all that type of thing um, that's what I'll do. But yeah, the moment um, after the surgery, I started straight away. I went saw a physio. I think we did some uh, like a little bit of work as well. He gave me some you know pointers and some advice and stuff like that. And I was just I went and saw a really good um, um, strength and conditioning coach, and I just mm. started training pretty much. So um, and I was doing it you know, three four times a week, just every week that. And I didn't actually do any rolling or jujitsu um, until probably at least two two and a half three months after the surgery so i definitely struggled with a bit of cardio and stuff like that <laughs> at the tournament anyway but um just like you guys talked about before um i had to like adjust a lot um how i was training and you mm. know i would always avoid people going towards the leg that was injured and stay always to this side and all these types of things so there's a lot of adjustment i had to do and initially as well like um, the first times that I sparred, I only trained with people that were way lighter than me. Yeah. And, you know, I was letting them come to these positions, but avoided things that I felt like would hurt my knee. So there was a lot of adjustment and there's a lot of um, things I had to kind of do differently. But I think it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise for me, um, particularly like tactically. Um, because, I, you know, I really like to exchange and fight with people and do all this stuff because, you know, that's just kind of my personality and how I enjoy um, doing jujitsu and stuff, but it really forced me to be way more tactical and mm. way more precise with the things I was doing. And I kind of like stuck more to a game plan. Yeah. And yeah. Um, like Eduardo is saying, like fighting all these guys, Herbert Santos and kind of Duarte and all these really good guys, like I feel like I actually did a lot better um, in terms of the outcomes of the tournament just because. I, I had to be I was forced to be more tactical more laterally yeah, yeah. I had to yeah. I just had to um, stick to a game plan and kind of like apply techniques in a much more um, systematic kind of way rather than just like fighting with people and like hey I'm going to attack the guy I have what I want and see what happens so were you concerned about um, the, about the knee while you were competing while I was, was competing it, was look I, I, there's always a little bit of doubt and stuff like that but I, I prepared very well um, I trained fairly hard like and, and leading up to like the last two weeks I, I did like proper hard sparring and stuff like yeah. that um, I definitely did like protect my knee as much as possible like I strapped my knee as much as I could and, yeah. and all these things like that but, but I remember I remember yeah. what, having this conversation with you that uh, when you went, uh, you playing that very strategic game, and you had a half guard on Kane, uh, Kane and Duarte, and when you went up, you had his leg. Yeah, yeah. And when you had his leg, you had it for a long time, and like you, you said, Len, I, I didn't know, I didn't want to put him down because I wasn't feeling, you know what I mean, a hundred percent, like yeah. what, like you know, mm. like a scramble when you kind of like so. Did it change your takedown game much? I mean, obviously um, that's probably where your knees a little bit more at risk that, or no the takedown stuff didn't really change so much honestly the thing that I struggled with the most in the tournament um, was the gas like I yeah, because I hadn't yeah. sparred like normal and um, like leading up to the last like two weeks or whatever or three weeks where I was starting to go hard it's just not enough time to kind of like build the like the cardiovascular level yeah, that I need to yeah. be at that level so that's probably the thing I struggled with the most um, just like you know, four or five minutes into the fight or whatever, there's the, yeah, I'm not I'm not at the cardio level I should be. So I hope I tape I hope I tap him out soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, how but, much time I'm looking at the time that's not yeah. usually something to do, but th this time I was looking and double checking all the time how much time's left. So and I definitely struggle with the cardio a lot more. But even then the outcome of this competition is that you got like uh you got third in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. out of that, Absolutely. out of that crazy, you know, rehabilitation and and, and injury, like a, one of the worst injuries, like he got third in the world, um, and not many people know that. Like it's probably it is the only Australian um, 
in a gi male black belt division to be a world medalist mm -hmm. you know what I mean so after the injury so this is a completely uh, amazing um, achievement I guess you know yeah, yeah. just highlights how ticket. important that part of athletics and and just like for normal people also like if you if you want to talk about like everyone's goals and everyone's different like my goal is to go and compete and stuff like that and peg peggy's goal is to um you know train until he can't you know walk anymore or whatever <laughs> when he's 70 or 80 years old so like this is such an important aspect of of any physical hobby you know mm. what i mean like you, you have to address this thing if you have issues and you don't address them like you said and you just keep training and keep training and there's many many guys that um you know where we train at kelvin grove or at your gym mm. in Amber, there's many people that choose that other approach and you know they might last might, might last five years or six years or seven years but at some point something's got to give you know what i mean <laughs> denial's not a river in africa no yeah. i'm all right i'll just keep training, keep and training it'll fix right. it. yeah. but eventually nah. something's gonna go something's <laughs> gonna go like you definitely do have to address this and it's a really important um, thing to talk about for everyone. You you need to find some type of balance. For mm. me, I've struggled with that as well. Like I've always wanted to train all the time and do this and the more injuries I've had and the more this and the more like overcoming all those injuries, the more you realize like, no, you need to do yoga if, if that's the thing is all yeah, mobility two, three times a week and you might have to cut back one of your sparring sessions or mm, you might need true. to cut back one of your weight sessions. And you need to lift weights as well if you're a competitor. If, yeah. if you're not competing, it's not as necessary, of course. But like you, you need to find the balance for you, and that's probably one of the more difficult things about um, finding a balance in anything. Is everybody's different, and that's it. you might need to stretch this many times a week, and I might need to stretch, you know, four or five times a week because I'm just, you know, less mobile or genetically slightly, you know you know it's harder for me to get into certain postures and things like that but and i think i think the big thing is like everyone's comparing themselves relative to others for sure um yeah. so they're looking at oh this guy's doing all these things why can't i do that and you're like well you don't know where he is outside of the gym he might actually have a lot of free time to facilitate all this yeah. stuff yeah. this guy here well you're working full time you've got two kids yeah. and you just can't fit that don't compare yourself to him compare yourself to where you are right now and what are some changes that you can make that are sustainable that that you can develop to, to keep your training sort of thing and um yeah i think i think that's a big thing everyone's looking at themselves at these instagram models and mm -hmm. the fit, fitness thing and they're, they're like oh, why aren't i like that and you're like well because they're living a completely different lifestyle yeah. and you just got to understand that everybody's different sort of thing so but that brings me to another question michael that i actually um thought about asking you um you have you know every every guy every person that's been training for a long time you know black belts you have a very um different game right mm. like you you you're a very flexible guy you're a very uh longilinious person right mm. so you have a, a very uh distinct game um and do you, uh, what do you believe the question is do you believe that it's your body shape will actually lead to you have a certain game as well oh absolutely yeah uh, what's I your opinion on that I, th I think um like bearing in mind that the thing I love about jiu-jitsu is that you don't have to be physically gifted in an attribute or have attributes that oh well you're not like this so you can't I love do jiu-jitsu yes you know like whereas oh, you chew you chew you you overweight no you can have a game for overweight totally, you can have yeah. a game for a skinny yeah I agree yeah and, and like like I said that like it's my mantra pretty much is the answer is always it depends so you just and I think a good coach can sort of see like a, a person with a certain structure come in and go okay so I'm going to foster the way that I coach this guy into a certain game and in, not encourage it but just sort of make sure that the techniques you kind of go well you'll just have to adjust it a little bit based on mm -hmm. that guy's nowhere near as flexible sort of thing so mm -hmm. um, I've been tailoring the way that I teach my my game to be able to well, well how do I fit that for old mate mm -hmm. over here is like well I'm going to have to use different structures i'm going to have to turn and change a lot more angles and stuff but like obviously there's some things that i can do that other people can't and vice versa so i'll always try and teach them a game that i don't normally do um but yeah i, I think the key to good coaching is being able to facilitate the techniques for someone that does, doesn't necessarily have your physiology but yeah your your structure and, and your physical attributes i think definitely dictates what style of game that you can 
you can do sort of thing. Yeah, and what you gravitate towards. Naturally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Totally. Like another thing on terms of like coaching, like as as you've like recently opened your gym and that type of thing, and um, it, like a lot of people kind of see jujitsu as like this fairy tale lifestyle. That's like, man, I'm just going <laughs> to turn up from the beach and have a coffee and all that. Hawaiianas, you must have the Hawaiianas. Yeah. <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, you're just going to you know teach for like two three hours a day and that's it and go home and come back. But like. What are some more of the challenges that you've kind of faced, like coaching and opening a new gym and that type of thing, the realistic challenges, not like this kind of like fairy tale idea of it's just going to be like uh, the Never Back Down movie where you just kind of <laughs> hang out there with the guy and it, it's a little bit unrealistic. Um, there's a lot of mopping. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Heaps of mopping, you know. We've like, done it, we've done it, yeah, we've done it. You know those, those memes where they're like, I do jujitsu. What my friends think I do, what these go, what I when and what I actually do is, is there's a picture of me mopping the mats most yeah. of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but um, oh, it's don't get me wrong, I really love it. Mm. But there's more to it than just turning up and coaching. There's yeah. a lot of you got a lot of if you want the the machine well oiled, you got to do a lot of admin and have your back background stuff sort of in place so that you what you can do then is focus on being a good coach yeah never mind the advertising and all that sort of stuff is what gets bums on seats is your ability to convey information to a variety of people Mm. so make sure you have all that background stuff sorted so that you can deliver a good service to your people sort of thing Mm. um but you're probably looking at spending just as much time on the mats as you are doing all that stuff probably more so and especially in the beginning is you, you're just trying to find out the wherewithals and stuff but um i took the easy i'm laughing now because you said especially the beginning and i i, I don't I, it's still the beginning the way. yeah it's, I know. it's gonna be going this yeah. is gonna be ongoing don't, <laughs> but don't think it's gonna change but i'm still no but i'm noticing that my life's getting a little bit more manageable because I'm understanding it a little bit more much much the same like you you know like you learn to ride a skateboard or something you you're understanding the mechanics of it and your 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 procedures get a bit more efficient but like I, I think I kind of feel like I took the easy road because when I started this gym I was like oh Ed I'm just gonna copy and paste you <laughs> up here I don't want to I'm not here to reinvent the wheel you're, you're a successful coach already how do you do it? Okay, I'm going to do it exactly the same. I might find a way that works better for me down the track, yeah. but why would I do something different if you're already successful kind of thing? I think that's really... Admit that you're not great at something and, and find someone that has done it before. Basically. So, Michael, Michael, for people that don't know, he opened a Gaha gym, so he opened a, a branch uh, at uh, Nambour in Sunshine Coast. And uh, he, before that, and that's how we do it, like he is a long-time student, um, got his black belt, and also taught here at the gym. I really, this is how I was uh, brought up in Brazil, like before you actually open a gym. It's a great experience if your coach see the potential on you and uh, you have this desire. Uh, he brings on on board and you actually teach and have the experience under his guidance, he'll give you his expertise in a few issues because there's a lot of issues that you have to, they will come once in a while in a gym. It's very important to understand how to manage them. And like Michael said, like having procedures in place uh, of that, 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 that in this case, like I provided to, to him, it makes it easier to be able to focus on the teaching, on focus on people and, and teaching jiu-jitsu. I think it's crucial to have this operation successful mm. and uh and and you're doing a great job you know like you're doing an amazing job there he has a a, a model gym actually like a, one of the best uh floors uh uh in terms of setup in, in australia i should say you know it's amazing setup uh great location uh great facilities and he's doing a great job as a coach and another question following up michael how do you feel because agarra uh, Anton is amazing, he's really good at, like, we, we all, every year, we, we sit down, we put a program, and what do you feel in regards that, uh, so it's like a, in, in chains, like a block of techniques? Yeah, it's like a curriculum, pretty much, mm. for, like, just to, like, kind of maximize the learning that you can kind of put out, mm. rather than just showing random things randomly, you just kind of, like, structure a little bit more, it's not a curriculum so much, but you're just going to structure the teaching a little bit. And I think that leads a lot more to kind of like better results. We've done that. that. We've done that. Like mm. this is our second year and we had a great success. 
Uh, and we always reassess, like at the end of the year, have a meeting, we reassess, and then we set up a new one. So this year we set up a new one. And um, you were a guy that uh, always had sequences, like I saw the way you taught before, you know, and you always had following sequences. And, and you go there and you, you train with your students, kids or adults, you see that they have these. Uh, and I just want to know um, how you're finding that program, like that mm -hmm. we... Uh, but we, we we have a tremendous success here, but how are you actually finding? But I, like I said to you before, we talked to the, the other day on the phone, and I said, you're the one that already doing the yeah, most was... <laughs> before. You know, like, this is something for you. It's just keep doing what thinking. you're doing. Just have a look at the program, but follow what you've been doing anyway. Yeah, I feel like a bit foolish. I was like, what is this? And you're like, and you were like, pretty much what you're, oh, okay. What? All right, so that's what I'm doing. Anyway, I've, I found that, um, yeah, when we were doing the teaching blocks prior, um, which was still working, you know, like, for example, you go, oh, okay, we're doing a guard pass here. Okay, if they block this one, you, you change to this. So you, you are kind of getting sequences, but it boxes, it, I found it, it compartmentalizes. Mm. And rather than, like, um, particularly because I've got a high volume of white belts at the moment, I've got, to, you know, most of my guys in intake are, are fresh. So what it, I think what it did is compartmentalize chain of events and and as a result they go well i've i've passed that what do i do now whereas, and what and yeah what? yeah whereas whereas you're still teaching them these sequences but over the over the course of the year but what what it's doing now is immediately implementing a game plan yes and and you see that in the guys when they're rolling now they you, you see them going bang to bang to bang to bang they're, they're moving to these different things much more fluently rather than at some points when they for example they pass the garden into side control you see the cogs turning a little bit rather than at this point now and it's only been two months but it's been a massive improvement is that they're going that they're, they're slicker in their transitions to the next kind of movement uh, or their next line in the in the in the chain of events kind of thing so they understand the game totally, eh? getting yeah. this bigger picture of the whole kind of situation which i think is something that you mentioned which is important to understand is like for people that are newer or you know just beginning that's a much better approach i feel mm. like particularly with like the juniors or the kids as well that helps a lot like just showing them like all right what's the idea what's the goal overall yeah. all right when you're on the top or if you're on the bottom what's your goal mm. all, right, all right this is the goal and you can make it into as many steps as you want but the more kind of like basic and, and simple it is the easier it is for people to kind of go like oh okay i understand that now i can go and apply it whereas like like you're talking about like the comp um like um compartmentalizing kind of like the different situations i think that's something that probably you should gravitate towards doing towards guys that are much more experienced mm. because like as you get more experience, the little details kind of add up to more. You know what I mean? Mm. So, and they develop their own kind of game plan by then, and they understand for sure, for sequences sure, yeah. are important too. Absolutely. Sort of thing, like yeah. they kind of already got the big picture, but now they have to get um, a bit tighter and a bit sharper yeah. with all the little details little of focus. how to actually mm. achieve that. Because it's not so simple to achieve the overall picture when you're going and training with somebody that's experienced, or good, or tight, or sharp. So, like. Like you said, exactly um, if you can kind of like gravitate towards teaching those beginners and, and guys that are newer or, or girls or children that are newer, that kind of like basic overall view, they're going to have much more success and, and, and a, a lot better result initially. And then people that are already have that kind of foundation and stuff, then you can kind of break it up into those more... Um, in-depth kind of scenarios in, in each situation that i think that's what we've kind of found by experimenting with mm. like the programs and stuff like that and changing up the um the learning blocks and things like that but that's definitely something that seems to be the case and i think what you're exposing these people the the, the new people to is uh, a larger variety of positions in a shorter space of time whereas like say for example newbie comes in you teach them a series of guard passes and they don't know where to go from there. Mm -hmm. And and then if they're on, say for example, you teach them a series of guard passes and then they're on their back and they're lost. Yeah. So so at least you're exposing them to more positions overall yeah. and which allows them to sort of start thinking a bit more laterally much earlier yeah, in, yeah. in their piece sort of thing. And for, for the coach point of view as well, I like about the these new curriculums that we're not... Uh, 
it's not regimented like we don't mm -hmm. have to show the same technique like we show a technique we show a sequence from a certain position and each coach will then uh, show uh, that position you know or a different submission if it's a, a super wide belt like a you know simple submission and with with the sequence but nothing like oh it has to be the, there's not because it's an art at the end of the day mm -hmm. so and each one has a different game so you can always go and show okay what's the big picture but the big picture can be a little bit different you know what i mean mm -hmm. and you give a little bit of option and depending body shapes and 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 uh, how they approach you so they might use that one more you know they might use a uh arm triangle more than arm but you know what i mean like in in that that goes with giving providing this um the, the the difference for for people to explore mm -hmm. and get better i think that's always annoyed me with like um because i did kung fu for years and then um like uh, my friends have done karate so i'd help them coach helped coach them the like nationals in karate and all that sort of stuff but the thing that always frustrated me was that they were very rigid on the structure that they used for their carters or their forms and things yeah. like oh well that's not a proper carter because you're not putting your leg in this position it's like yeah but look at this dude's legs he's he's a grasshopper of course he's not going to get that low his movements are going to be stunted and look awkward how about you're allowing him to change a little bit yes and i think like we again coming back to jiu-jitsu is like oh look it works cool it's jiu-jitsu yeah you, you know yes. like uh, it's it's sort of um with the traditional martial arts which i think is going <laughs> to let them get left behind a little bit to be honest is that there's mm -hmm. this rigid thing that doesn't allow like coaches to show their own flavor and, and things like that it's like no your leg has to be like that otherwise it's not good enough and and that's just you, you just can't do that you know like uh -huh. and, Especially if you look at the origins of different martial arts, their physiology is a little bit different. So of course, so you know, like some someone might not be able to get that low based on the fact that they're a completely different physiology. You know, so it's I, I think that's um, that's the advantage of jiu-jitsu. You change, you, you can adapt it to suit different people. Whereas like other, like I said, other martial arts is just too rigid. Like in their in their teaching frame, like teaching framework sort of thing. And I love that the the idea that we're doing this curriculum as a for all the Gaha gyms. So you know, like we can all be on the same page, and when we go train with the other guys, we're all exploring the same thing. Mm. I think this is even better, you know. I and love you, that. And the the funny thing is, I notice when I see on the footage of you guys showing what you're doing, and and what I'm working on with my guys, and like it's not it's not like we're all interconnected like you know like psychically but we all seem to be doing really similar stuff anyway that's because that's what it's, works you know what I yeah, mean? yeah exactly. totally. let's say i find the same thing like i'll go and train or do this or um someone will show you oh man this is a video of these guys this is what they work on eh, man all the guys that are the best in the world or whatever they all do the same stuff yeah, yeah and it's totally. not because they all work together and tell each other it's because this is what works the movements work like mm. this the mechanics of your body work like this so you're going to find that everybody's doing very very similar stuff there totally. might be slightly different details to things but everything's the same because totally. you've got two arms and two legs he's got two arms and two legs i've got two arms and two legs you know what i mean and our and a, and a spine and a head and like you know what I mean the physical body never changes the ranges of motion are the same correct the, yeah, yeah you know yeah. the guy might be more mobile here or there but it doesn't change the mechanics you're going to use or, or the like the ideas or, or concepts you're going to use to be effective with whatever you're applying mm. so I think that's um, something super important that people start to understand because I think a lot of people coming into jujitsu or you know particularly from other martial arts whatever they have this idea that there's this like one position or there's this one thing or there's this special situation that you're going to learn that'll um, you know kind of address everything which just doesn't exist and there's Everything. a lot of marketers you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean like people marketing that you know like yeah, yeah. learn these now and you know like it's not that yeah <laughs> there's, there's good and bad about everything you do like like anything in life like we talked about before with finding balance you have to find balance with the movements as mm. well and, and the techniques and you, you, no one's going to be perfect no one's going to be good at everything and the, even the things you're good at there's a way that someone can approach that to you know nullify that and make that not so effective everything has a good aspect and a bad aspect and yeah, totally. the more you kind of realize that 
the more you start to understand that like Jiu Jitsu is a lot about just making decisions. There's nothing unique about the movements. Yeah, yeah the yeah. movements are the same for everybody because we all move the same. But what's unique is how well you make decisions with those movements. Mm. Uh, with those movements, like you know, playing a game of chess. You got the same pieces. I got the same pieces. That's it. It's yeah. How well I apply my little strategy. That's it. And yeah. that that's what you're really learning. Like you you are rehearsing the movements and how to do them. But at the end of the day, like what is the game itself? It's like how well you use those movements that you've learned. Yeah, yeah that's and it. that's something that I think people should focus on a little bit more, particularly um, to do with like competition and sparring and things like that, rather than going like, man, I'm really good at a kimura. I'm just gonna yeah, spam yeah. a kimura until I get one. Like, man, it's a game. It's a game. I talk to a lot about. Uh, I talk to my guys a lot about. Um, gathering data on positions so like the people often get fixated on the need to win every role yeah. but what you're not going to gather is data on a position so for example being on your back in side control don't be in such a hurry to frantically get in back into this position sit in this position and understand how to be comfortable where to put your arms in such yeah. a way that you can move and stuff and until you do that until you gather data on going, well, people are only going to move one in three ways. Okay, now that I know that they move in one in three ways, how can I manipulate them into that way to get what I need? But you're not going to know that unless you stay in that position or say, for example, in someone's guard, you know, like uh, how do I just be in the guard for a while and understand that, okay, if I put my arms and my, my legs in this position, they usually move one or two ways so how do I engineer them into this position now? Like, but you're not you're not going to see that if you're so busy concentrating on winning all the time. Yeah, result you know, like, based kind of. Thing. Yeah, like that's you it. always it, it, the thing is is like it, this is a skill, and like any skill, it takes time to get good at it. You're not going to win every exchange. You're not going to win every role. It's impossible. Mm. But if you come with that mentality, it's really hard to learn. Like you're saying. Because you don't you don't assess anything. You never look into how things work. You don't just think laterally at all. I mean, you only think about the outcome, and if you only think about the outcome, that's all that's on your mind. You just <laughs> it's an animal brain. You know what I mean? That fight yeah. or flight response. It, it's not a battle to the death. You, you're not gonna die. You're not gonna win any money. <laughs> you're not gonna steal anything from you. There's nothing seriously bad that's gonna happen. You're just gonna feel a little bit shitty because ah uh, you had to tap or because you couldn't get out of this situation or whatever. But Instead of like, um, you know, fixating that and getting upset, you kind of, like you said, it's much better to start to assess and analyze and go, well, okay, well, every time I tried to get out of the situation, the guy did this and this and this. And now, all right, how can I use that reaction to help mm. with my goal, which is get back to this situation or protect myself or position my neck so I'm not in danger? I think it's definitely important to have those hard roles, but um, yeah, you'll only ever bring 10%. You'll only bring your A grade, A grade game, and you won't allow it expand yourself, like a, expand your learning sort of experience from that role if you don't For sure. sort of relinquish For sure. this need to win all the time. Like, well, the majority of the time when you're training, what's the goal? It's to learn, right? Yeah, it's not that's to win. It. We're training. <laughs> it's not a competition. If you want to bash people, you go to a competition. You know, what I mean? yeah, you go that's and it. compete against people that are going there with the same mentality. I want to be. I want to test my ability against you. But when you're training, it should be 80, 70, 80, 90% of the time, you're just working on skills. That's it. Learning to improve, you know what I mean? And uh, that that is difficult for people. And I think um, this is something that I kind of want to transition to, but like culturally, I think like people have different ideas of that. Like if you go and um, compete or train or travel the world, like I think a lot has to do with culture and expectation and stuff like mm. that and how people actually approach learning in general. And competition and stuff like that and that's something that I've seen a lot traveling and competing um, it's harder for certain people to you know be more relaxed and, and kind of let it go more, the ego yeah let it go the mm. ego and, and focus more on learning like some cultures it's really really difficult for people to do that and some cultures it's super easy it's just a game it's you know we're just doing this thing yeah, and you, yeah, win, yeah. You, you beat me haha <laughs> let's go again and then other cultures man there's no you know, they don't get an inch. on the yeah, line. on the line, fighting <laughs> to the death over every little tiny thing. It's really interesting, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's something that um, I think a lot of people should kind of look into in themselves a little bit. Like, all right, well, how do I approach training? What do mm. I do? Because if I'm struggling with learning, maybe it's something I need to change in, in my approach to that type of stuff. 
and also I think a lot of people focus on themselves only or like I want to submit I want to do this move but it's a decision process but it's also based on timing mm. the right timing if you're it's not the right timing you know what I mean? you can't have the decision proper like you know mm. and and a proper decision so if you if you you need to look at your your training partner he you need to look at him as much as you look at you mm. to see when it's going to be the time or you see when you're going to trick him into a position and you can't just force things you're going to have to see what he's going to give to you and people will lose a lot of time think about themselves rather than think about the other person you know mm. there's a um you need to relax to be able to look at the other person there's a there's a really good book called the unfettered mind and it's this a series of essays from like a um japanese Zen master to a Japanese sword master, and he talks about like um, the sword master said, "Oh, Zen Buddhism and sword play have nothing in common." He's like, "Oh, quite the contrary, they're very similar." So he goes in the first essay is 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 what the others sort of come off, and it talks about the ignorance and the abiding place. So what what he means by that is like um, abiding place means your mind is set on this one thing. Um, and if you sort of, in, in his case, if you're related to sword players, like I'm thinking about the sword, I'll get cut down by the sword. If I'm looking at his hand, I'll get cut down by the sword. You must be everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And when you're talking about getting fixated on having to do this one thing all the time, he's like, your, your mind's going to be everywhere and nowhere at once. Only then will you react to, truly in the moment sort of thing. Yeah. And sort of finding ways to have your mind nowhere and everywhere at once you get you start to have an authentic rebuttal to to what this person's imposing on you rather than sitting here going i have to get this sweep and you're like well, yes yeah. it's not happening where else where, where else, else is available yeah, yeah totally you know like flow to this next thing sort of thing so finding your ability to be everywhere and nowhere at once is and know, observe too because uh, when you're outside, you can you can see oh, oh this person or when he's training with you, you can see oh this person only passes to the left, mm. this person only do a certain pass, this person um, uh, just uh, tries it. This person has two moves like submissions that are very dangerous. So you're gonna train with him. He's a great. He does triangles like you expect. You know what I mean? Like mm. what defense I'm gonna do? You're already playing. Don't let him close the legs. Blah blah blah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to be super observant, and that's why you're quiet. Uh, knowledge to have the best start strategy in place to be able to do it better you know like yeah. it's if, not just by forcing and your you're, way you're too busy doing your thing yeah you, you're not even noticing what what they're doing and meantime you're like Correct. oh and they're going oh, around to you about your like, what happened it's yeah. too late so it's the difference about being technical just yeah. like one thing that i want to kind of like um focus on is um it, like we all have our own struggles learning and stuff like that but what are like the main challenges that you've kind of faced like we can all talk about it because we've all coached and we've all you know instructed and stuff like that but what are the main like challenges that you faced with like teaching um students like problematic situations or like what's the what's the biggest challenge you've kind of faced you know instructing uh i think it's um i think it's really important to change your vernacular to suit people um, yeah. So that so that they get a level of understanding because you can say something to one person and they don't understand it. Like, what is it? They um different types of learning. There's visual. There's um, aesthetic, like physical. Yeah, physical and stuff. Some people so missing auditory, that. Or, yeah, audio yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really important to identify how people learn really quickly. Yeah. Um, and that'll allow you to sort of. Uh, super highway them into into acquiring skills and stuff like that um personally my learning like learning difficulties i think would was just um my ability to get there enough often enough sort yeah. of thing and i learn by doing things thousands and thousands of times you know it's it's like i can see something and uh it won't sink in until i've done it a yeah. lot you know yeah. and, and for me personally, the answer is always in the repetition. So it's 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 finding the time to be able to go right. Let's sit down and do this over and over and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. And then and then because it becomes this sequence in your brain, then you can start going. Well, that's that's just in there now. And now I notice that you, you start to see the nuance in it a little bit more. But I have to do it over and over and over again. But it might be different for for some people. But what I have noticed for white belts is that no, you just gotta 
don't pontificate. Don't do one technique and go, I feel it was like this and maybe we should do it. Yeah, no, yeah. no, just do it over and over and over again. Don't stop until you can't do it anymore. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. So that, that's <laughs> one of the things that I yeah. see, like the new guys sort of talking about what they feel. Oh, I felt it should have been this. No, no, you just wasted a repetition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do another rep. Like, do you know do what I say about this? I say, until you're actually doing in training all the time, you don't know the position. Some yeah. people think that they 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 drill the position while the coach show the position. They drill and they're like, okay, next. I already know this one. Yeah, but man, yeah. You just know when you're doing training. Otherwise, you don't know. Don't let's be honest. You know. That's it. Yeah, it's like do it again. What do I do now? Again, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more. <laughs> I think my kind of issue has been like I I have never really struggled with learning techniques and like you know I can go and watch something on YouTube or mm. see someone else do it in training and kind of just kind of like figure it out and understand it and then go and apply it. But I, I definitely struggled a lot teaching because I, I started you know pretty young. I think maybe it was like eighteen, nineteen already, like doing classes and stuff like that, and I definitely you know, had like probably more emotional things that I would get upset about. Like I, I felt like sometimes people weren't respectful or didn't mm. want to listen to me much because I was younger than everybody. And, you know, I'd get like a, a little pissed off and annoyed about that type <laughs> of stuff. And also like, just like your expectation of people, like my expectation for myself is super high and I, I want this standard of stuff all the time. Mm. And, like, you should be training this hard and you should be doing this. And that kind of like bleeds out into you into the coaching. And sometimes I would get annoyed and pissed off because people couldn't do a technique after two, three weeks. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Man, I've been showing this for three weeks. You guys still can't do it. But like, but everybody's different. You know what I mean? Everyone's standard is different, and everyone learns differently as well. And I think man, that's something that I really struggle with a lot, is particularly starting coaching. And you've come from a position of you're you're very aware. Um, physically in terms of you've always been a uh, high level of competitive sports and all yeah. that sort of stuff and always an elite athlete yeah. always been thought by elite coaches for elite athletes that yeah. expect a high expectance expectancy you know what i mean what they have to achieve go again you know like yeah i think that shapes yeah. him in that and and probably shows the initial struggle and you and you've sort of so so in doing that you're you're very aware of your body and how it moves and stuff and i think like it's like when someone says to me oh, i can't swim i've swum all my life and i swing since i was three and i'm like oh, i don't understand how that works and then you've got to sit back and remember oh well you don't it's all about exposure these guys haven't been exposed to the yeah. pool very often and things like and i think we as coaches you forget that all right, this guy's coming into the gym. He's been an office worker all his life. Prior to that, he was a gamer. Mm. Like he, he, he's never actually learned how to move his body. Yeah. So, so his, like, brain, his communication to his limbs and stuff is, is, is in terms of that development is way, way back compared to someone yeah. else. Like myself, surfing all my life and doing all so, so to acquire a skill is where we're a bit more streamlined in the processes especially like you said because you've, you've been elite level so you're you're training with coaches that um effectively de deliver communication really really well and things like that so you have adapted quite quickly and we just kind of forget that people aren't that where that where they've come from sort of thing For so sure. yeah i got i got advice that i never forgot about that because everyone when they start teaching they get super frustrated when people cannot, and um, so my coach said to me, never forgot that, he said, uh, don't worry if um, not everyone learns everything every day, mm. that's fine, because some people will click another time, some people will not going to even click when you're saying, and then five years on the track, another training mate from the same place, or another coach will say something, and he goes, oh, is that what it is, and you're going to say, Oh, but I told you that five years ago. Yeah. I said, oh, Jesus, but I didn't, you know, it will happen. So, but don't worry, don't take it personal. Um, and it's also like, if you start anything new, like, you know, like I, I started Pilates recently uh, and uh, it's a whole new uh, vocabulary. It's mm. a whole new way, even though you might have a completely good sense of your movements, etc. But it's such, it's such a different habit. It's just a different yeah. way, even the, 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 the words about they saying oh just put your feet on the and they, they call that a name there like a, a the, the 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 bed the, or, they have, yeah. yeah they have a different name and then just for that i already freak out what i have to do like you know yeah. you don't know it's the most simple command you know so when you when that things happen to you you can actually 
uh, relate to a, a beginner mm-hmm. when they come to class and you be a bit more understandable that this is going to happen and that's fine it's just part of the process I think I think and um people aren't uh, people aren't ready to listen um, they're not they're not always ready to listen just yeah. yet based on their exposure to what they're having difficulties with so they're not they're not forced they're not met with the problem maybe when they're rolling when you when you're teaching the technique yet so they don't understand why they need to do it and, and people don't hear until they're ready to listen sort of thing like you can tell something someone something till they're blue in the face until they actually do it and go oh wow I, d- I did this and it's like yeah you did that yourself don't worry yeah <laughs> it's all good but it's that's yeah it's um until they're posed with the problem they don't they're not going to be ready to sort of understand why they're going to going to do stuff really hey it's um but yeah it's good Coaching's been great. I, I love it. It's ma- actually made my game better, and there's a lot of things that, um, through coaching, certain techniques, um, so pivotal things in a technique that I never realised were partic- I was just doing them, yeah. but I never realised that that was one of the critical elements of that technique. Mm-hmm. And and now that I've focused on that, it's made that technique better. And I probably wouldn't have noticed that until I had to convey the information to someone else sort of thing so and i i personally loved to go in uh uh to the sunshine coast mm. like where you have the gym uh it's just a nice like the group of people are amazing we, we we trained last time we all went to a brewery had a nice meal mm. together i had a, a great opportunity to have a great chat with the 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 people that train with you and and they're fantastic people same mm. vibe and uh we actually doing an integration day. There are more people actually coming. Everyone goes to Sunshine. Everyone loves Sunshine Coast. You know, get a beach day out of it. Goes there, trains. This is very important, actually. Like we tell to people, like go to other places. Like, and we have gahas now in different locations. Just integrate yourself. You're gonna get different training partners. You know what I mean? You're going to have, a, you know, you can have like great. Uh, uh, after training as well, mm-hmm. just break completely the routine. You might go to the beach. You might go to the brewery. Have a, a awesome. Uh, pork ribs you know yeah. what I mean like I did and so on you know like so it's a great asset for us and looking forward to to go back there again you know I'm kind of happy the brewery opened up down the road there. it's not far I yeah. love it I love it have a, have a walk down and get a massive amount of ribs there it's I nice. love it <laughs> well I'm pretty happy with the guys down there our guys and girls there they're really really welcoming um got a really good strong community there and great bunch of people that's that's not something I had to particularly foster so and see, that this is that one question I also thought of, Michael, just to um, wrap it up this subject. Like, you went to an area that had um, a very, back on the days, had a, a, a reputation of not being uh, a, 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 a very nice area. Mm. Like, you know, have like problems, right? Um, and it is in constant transformation. I, when I went there, I was like, wow, you guys said that this place was a problem. Like, it doesn't look mm. like it, you know what I mean? Like, you have trendy cafes now, you have this beautiful brewery that could be in any capital city of mm. Australia, it's still going to do well. So, it's, it's a massive transformation. And how do you feel that uh, you were the first Jiu-Jitsu gym there, you know, and how do you feel that the impact in the community, because we know a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a lot more than just going and training Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. You, you actually make people uh, feel part, they belong to something, they, they identify themselves with something bigger than themselves, mm. you know, uh, and you create this bond, this network, this, um, like a family feeling that we do really well, we have this mm. lifestyle, and how do you feel that that impact, because, you know, last time we went there for grading, like you gave a ticket to everyone to go to the shop, do the shop yeah, down the road yeah. and have a coffee, and you brought it back, uh, we all went back to the brewery after, have a great, like, how do you feel that there is impact in the community itself? Um, I think uh, it's a good sense of belonging and that no one's left out too. Um, so anyone that can come in, they could, you know, welcome, welcome them with open arms kind of thing. But like, I mean, I'm saying that too, I think Nambour's on an upward trajectory as well. The, the new council that we got in, uh, David Law, he's wants to re- reinvigorate the community and re- reinvigorate Nambour so he's looking to make it an entertainment area and try and bring people back as an arts hub and all that sort of stuff so I'll be back to that brewery I'll yeah. tell you. 
So being and being in the location, we're like very fortunate to be in a location that we have because it's turning heads now. And, and when people come in, particularly kids, uh, it's it's fostering people to become better people rather than necessarily. Oh, I'm not I'm not here to teach you how to kick butt. I'm I'm here to foster you to make good decisions based on your knowledge of martial arts. You know, to be to be compassionate people. Give good values, eh? Yeah, 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 and to you know to to show compassion through your knowledge of martial arts, not to, oh well, I'm gonna knock this guy down and stomp on his head and things like that. It's like, no, I've controlled this guy. I don't need to do anything anymore. It's like you're showing that person compassion, and that's kind of the thing that I want to try and foster in the community, in the in our jiu-jitsu community. Is like, you have these, you have the tools to not necessarily hurt someone or anything like that, and I think that carry out carries over in their behaviours a little. In, in behavior a little bit mm. it's like no you have these tools but you can make the right choices to to not be that guy basically that 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 you don't have to destroy people because you know some stuff it's you know i, I love training killer nerds basically that, mm. that make good decisions but have this skill set that that's uh something for life and they can protect themselves kind of thing i think that's really important um good decisions are really important is there, is there anything else um, you'd like to address? Like, is there anything that, like to, that you would like to say? Um, look, just like one last thing to wrap everything up, but what's everyone's opinion on kind of like online um, learning and online techniques and things like that? Because I think like it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. There's a lot of good aspects of it and there's a lot of negative aspects to it as mm. well. Like, what, are, what are your points of view on, on that kind of subject? I think, I think it's... Uh like yeah you hit the nail on the head i think it's good and bad you i think you have to be very strict on your content that you watch otherwise you go down the rabbit hole of learning a 600 different things and yeah, then yeah. and then having a wash of techniques in in one particular movement you set goals very clear goals for yourself when you're looking at online content and and find something and go oh, i'm only going to do this thing and I need to harness that thing because how many times we've been looking at YouTube and we're going, oh, I just want some subtle nuances on guard pass and then you're looking at flying barambolos like 10 minutes later, but yeah, yeah. It, like st stick to having rules of, of, of content that you watch rather than just trying to watch all and everything mm. and then not good at, you know, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. I agree. Yeah. I think that's really important to kind of explain. I think um, it's very common for particularly people that are just starting out jiu-jitsu or even guys that have been training for a long period of time to just like memorize thousands of techniques but not be able to apply any of them in live training. So um, you can actually learn a lot from online content because they are explaining or giving you the ideas mm. um, for positions and situations and concepts and all these things that are really important for you to improve your jiu-jitsu. But you still have to do the physical work. Like, that's only half of the picture. Yeah. You, know? and you still got to go there and spend, you know, three months finalizing it and getting it really tight and sharp so that when you go and do train, you can actually do it in live training. You got to do the repetitions. As yeah, say, reps, you know I mean? yeah. Rather than um, just watching the video 30 times and like, oh, I know what to do now. What's the next thing? We get, yeah. we get a lot of, you see a lot of this in exercise physiology. You get new graduates and, New graduates are like a little kid that has got their first Swiss Army knife and they're like, they get their first patient or whatever. And this kind of extends over to Jiu Jitsu as well, definitely. is like, I've got this new thing. Oh, someone wants an exercise program. Well, I'm going to pull out the scissors. I'm going to pull out the, the screwdriver and then I'm going to get this. I'm going to get the nail file to file this back and blah. And here's this massive thing. Five years down the track, you like realize, I just need the knife. For most things, I just need the knife rather than necessarily pulling out all these tools just for the one. Nah, actually, the knife is just going to do. <laughs> so you're, you're cutting it all back to just what what do you need at that time, sort of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that there is there is a lot of content content out there, but there is a lot of sens sensationalism. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of like three back flips. You know what I mean? And five rolls, <laughs> like. Do you want to look good or do you want to be effective? Yeah, you know? that's it. And if you want to be effective, you have to look for content that actually follow the structure of your gym that gives you more insight so you can mm. use uh, at, at you know in training and also like you said like 
Don't think that you can come and get 30 positions and just call your mate and show him just to look good. Mm. But try to get, you know, two that maybe already have some something to do with your already game that you already have so that more chances to happen so you can explore there and be more successful in that. It's a slow process. You can't... It will be very helpful. It's a good assistance, but you can't neglect the training and you mm. have to be slow, you know, and find the right content as well. And, you be, know? and be strict with what you watch. Like, be... Sort of have a goal. Like, yeah. I think that's in... It transcends jiu-jitsu is make sure you have meaningful goals that you feel like you can achieve as well rather yes. than just, I'm going to do all this at once. Like, no, what's, what's your goal here? Like, Boy, what, Anton right now, he just uh, released the BJJ 101, okay, which is an online library. Uh, I had the privilege to have a look and it's been amazing for myself and as a coach. There's a lot of things that you forget. There's a lot of like the, the higher belt you are, the fine details is actually what makes a difference between succeed and fa you know success and failure. And it's been awesome to give tweaks give ideas, uh, new positions that you've seen it before, but you don't have a clue how to do it anymore. Mm. Some things that you never seen it again because Jiu-Jitsu is about, is a limited knowledge. Like, and that's what I found fascinating and I'm open for learning. So any form of like good content, uh, I'm happy to to digest. So yeah, that's why he came up with BJJ 101 he's, he's, and it's great. It's been great. I totally recommend. Mm. Yeah, that's it, guys. But um, that's pretty much it. We're going to wrap everything up. So thanks so much, Michael Pegg, for coming thanks on. For it was me. really, really interesting, um, you know, talking with you about particularly all the exercise physiology stuff and your ideas about coaching and, and running a gym and everything like that. So thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been yeah. great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> and uh, I hope I'll see you soon, guys, on the mat as well, right? Yeah, for thank sure. You.